So in our last video, we talked about using timers to make something happen at set intervals. So you wanna have something that happens every 100 milliseconds or every two seconds, you can use a timer to do that. Next, we're going to talk about how you can use a timer to measure the elapsed time between two events, just like you would with a real stopwatch. So now, instead of having a predetermined internal time or a set interval at which you want things to occur, you have some external input. So again, we're using button presses as an example, but it could be a signal from a sensor or an external function generator or something, and you now want to measure the amount of time between when two things occur. So let's take a look at how we can do that. So let's have a reminder of what we've seen about timers so far. So in red here, we have a graph representing a timer running in normal mode, where it starts at zero, counts up to its maximum value, which is different depending on whether it's an 8-bit or a 16-bit timer. And then it's going to wrap around back to zero and keep going. We also saw a clear timer on compare mode, where you can pick some value in between zero and the maximum value and the timer will wrap around when it reaches that value. Instead, you can trigger interrupts when that occurs, and that gives you these interrupts at a set frequency. Now, let's consider the case where we have some external pulse. So, for example, I have a button with a pull-up resistor connected, so by default, that internal pin is going to be at 5 volts. When I push the button and hold it down, that pin goes to 0 volts, and then when I release the button, it's going to go back up to 5 volts. So, Let's say I want to measure the duration of this pulse or the width of this pulse in seconds. We already know from previous lessons that I can use these rising and falling edges to trigger either pin change or external interrupts. So I know I can detect when these individual events occur with my code and with interrupts, but I want to know the duration between them. And to do that, I need to use a timer. So we can do that by using what we've seen before, but just using timers a little differently. What I'm going to do is detect this first falling edge, and I can do that using either a pin change or an external interrupt. When I detect that, then I'm going to start my timer. So I'm going to overwrite my timer value at zero, so I know it's just like hitting the reset button on a stopwatch. My timer is going to start there and then start counting up. And then when I get to this next rising edge in this case, then I will have my next pin change or external interrupt. And I'm just going to read the value stored in my timer register there, and that's just like hitting stop on your stopwatch and grabbing the value for the elapsed time between these two points. The one thing I have to be careful about there is my prescaler and timer overflow. So depending on the length of what I expect to measure or the expected maximum duration of this pulse, I might need to increase my prescaler to slow my timer down. So if my timer is wrapping around too fast, for example, in this case, say my timer overflows three times and then I grab the timer value here. This value is not going to be correct. I haven't actually measured the total elapsed time. I've just measured the time between here and here. So you could get around this by adding some logic to your code to count the number of times the timer has overflowed. But instead, you could also just increase your prescaler to make sure that your total wraparound time for your timer is going to be longer than the maximum expected duration of this pulse, which may or may not be feasible depending on the type of input you're expecting. For example, in this button press example, you could, in theory, have someone who's just going to sit there and hold the button down for days, and you couldn't do that just with the timer prescaler. So now let's take a look at the simulation and the code. You'll see when I run this, I have my serial monitor open, so I'm going to click the button. And when I release, I have a number that prints out here that is the duration I had the button held down in milliseconds. So if I hold it down for a little longer, we will expect that button, that number to be bigger. So click release. So we see that number was about a second longer that time. Again, we don't totally trust exactly how timers are running in the browser. So this number might not be perfectly accurate, but if you were doing this on a real Arduino, you would expect this number to be much more accurate. So let's pause the simulation and look at the code that I have used to set this up. So let's look at this line by line, starting in the main function. So again, hopefully some of this is becoming familiar by now. So I have my button connected to pin seven. You can see I have no external pull up or pull down resistor. So I've used my data direction register to make sure pin seven is an input. Again, technically, since the default values are all zero, all the pins default to input, so you don't actually really need to write this line, but I like to do it for completeness. I am using the port register to enable the internal pull-up resistor on pin 7, so now I have this pin set up 
as an input to read my button press. I am going to enable a pin change interrupt on that pin. So I have a choice here. I could have connected my button to one of the pins for an external interrupt. So this is a choice you have. Again, when you only have one button, it doesn't really matter. But if you have lots of sensors, you might have to start thinking about which ones you would want to use for which purpose. I would have to go look at the data sheet to figure out which bits I need to set to one in these registers to enable the interrupt on that specific pin. Then I have my SEI command, which is going to enable interrupts globally. Next, I set up my timer. Again, we have the TCCR1A and TCCR1B registers, so you have to go to the data sheet and look up which bits you need to set to. In this case, we're going to set the timer to its normal mode, so we don't want clear timer on compare. We are going to be manually resetting the timer when we detect that pin change interrupt. We don't want the timer to be resetting on its own at some predetermined value. And in this case, I picked the biggest possible prescaler. So I want to detect the longest possible button press, which for timer one with that prescaler is going to get us up to a little over four seconds. So if timer wraparound worked in the browser, which again, we discussed in a previous video, the um, browser simulator is not actually simulating that properly. But if the timer did overflow and wrap around, then I wouldn't be able to detect a button press longer than about four seconds without some additional code. So I'm going to initialize my serial communication so I can print out the value to the serial monitor. And then I'm going to enter my infinite while loop, which doesn't have any code in it because all my functional code is going to be up in my interrupt service routine. Now, it's important to note that once you do this, the moment you have these two lines, the timer is on and running, even though I haven't clicked the button yet. So we are going to address that in our interrupt service routine. So I scroll up to that. You see I have ISR for my PCINT2 VEX, so that's for the pin, pin change 2 interrupt vector. And then I have an if statement that we've seen before to detect that button press, so pin D bitwise AND with this binary value is going to detect only if pin 7 is high, it doesn't care what the other values are. So let's look at the else part of that first, what to do if pin 7 is low. So my pin change interrupt has been triggered, I'm checking if the pin is high or low, which is going to tell me if it was a rising or falling edge. If the pin is low, then I'm going to reset my timer to zero. So remember that TCNT1 is the register that stores the timer value in it. So once you've activated the timer, this register is counting up, but you can also overwrite it. So I am just writing a value of zero to that register. That is like hitting reset on your stopwatch. So that happens, I exit my interrupt service routine, I go back down to my infinite while loop, I'm still looping, my timer is counting up. When I release the button, remember a pin change interrupt will detect either a rising or a falling edge. I'm going to go back up to my ISR because I've triggered another interrupt. This time my input is going to be high, so I will be in this part of the if statement. And you see I have a variable I have declared here, period, where I am converting the timer value, which is in clock ticks, to milliseconds by multiplying by the prescaler and then this conversion factor between clock ticks and seconds, and then I am just printing out that value. So again, when I run the simulation, let's think about this, what I'm doing, what I'm doing over here compared to the code I have on my setup. I click the button once, I'm holding it down, that is going to bring me up to this part of my code, I'm going to reset the timer to zero, and then when I release the button, I'm going to come up to the ISR again, and it's going to print out the duration I have had the button held down. So given all of that, here is your assignment for this lesson. We're going to combine a handful of things we have learned in previous lessons. I want you to change the code and the circuit as needed to measure the duration of a high pulse using an external interrupt instead of a pin change interrupt. So that means that the button value should be low by default when the button is not pressed and should go high when the button is pressed. And you should use an external interrupt instead of a pin change interrupt to detect that press and then measure the duration of that high pulse.